You know, uh, we were assigned about a year before flight, but before you knew it, uh, it seemed like we were sitting in the uh, white room putting our suits on. Here we all are on launch day about four hours prior. This is uh, Nancy Curry, our MS-2. It was her fourth flight. Rick, ready to go, and Jim, and Mike. Uh, he's a New Yorker, you can tell. Then on walkout, it's kind of like coming downstairs on Christmas morning. It's just an unbelievable thrill as you get out there. Uh, of course, the vehicle's parked in the vertical, so it's not like jumping into your car. It's a little bit of a haul to get yourself into the seat. And some of us are a little bit bigger and have a little bit more trouble. You can see Mike uh, getting himself in there uh, while the suit tech helps him. T minus 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia to broaden our view of the universe through the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, full program. Roger roll, Columbia. Uh, some things are better left unspoken. Uh, eight and a half minutes later, we were in orbit. Then uh, it's time to get the orbiter ready, unpack everything that was packed away for the launch, and get prepared for flight day three, which was the rendezvous with the Hubble Space Telescope. We rendezvoused up from below, uh, came up till it was just hanging there, perched above the payload bay. This is a shot of the uh, flight deck during the rendezvous. You can see that uh, we're working there in Columbia. Rick Linehan was our handheld laser operator. That's what gave us our ranges to the telescope when we first looked out to see it. It really was uh, a beautiful sight to see that uh, hanging up there. Of course, flying the rendezvous is uh, hand-flown. Uh, Tim Hagen, our instructor who taught us everything we knew, was there with us in spirit as we uh, pulled up to the telescope. You can see it through the optical sight there. Then Nancy used the robotic arm to reach out and uh, snare the Hubble Space Telescope. That's her working on the aft flight deck controlling that arm. This is the view that she had as she was uh, pulling up and overflying the snares. And you can bet that uh, once we had that thing on board, there was a lot of happy campers, a big sense of relief as we had those handshakes. Well, of course, once we had the Hubble, our day wasn't over. We had an ambitious uh, evening of rolling up the solar arrays. On the first servicing mission, STS-61, they had to jettison one array, so we were very anxious uh, to see. It was kind of a pivotal moment as we rotate the telescope here. One solar array stowed, uh, still wondering what was going to happen with the second one, and we rolled up the second one. And we were very, very fortunate that both solar arrays uh, rolled up. That set the stage for the next day, the first of five spacewalks, extravehicular activities. And we've combined uh, the two solar array days because over the first three days, we replaced nearly the entire power system of Hubble. And we started that by stowing the old solar arrays, the Solar Array 2s. These are arrays built by the European Space Agency, one of the partners on the Hubble Space Telescope and also an integral partner in the International Space Station. This is a view from uh, one of the helmet cams. That was a very useful tool throughout the mission. And so you'll have the opportunity today to see some of the views that we had inside of the spacesuit. After removing those solar arrays from the telescope, uh, we brought them back down into the payload bay and stowed them on one of the carriers that we brought up with us in the payload bay. And uh, using the power tool, which you see there on the lower right, we were able to lock those down into the payload bay for a return to planet Earth. Of course, the spacecraft choreographer, the IV crew member, inside crew member, is integral to the, all of the operations and uh, runs the show for each EVA. After we uh, got the uh, old solar arrays uh, on our carrier to take home, it was time to get the new solar arrays out. 
And uh, here's a view of how what we did. We got the solar rays out of the carrier, and then we had to rotate them on the arm. Uh, Scooter alluded to that earlier. Uh, we weren't tethered to the solar ray at this point. Uh, we didn't want to lose it, so we went really slow. And here's a view of the helmet camera. This is what we were looking at uh, as we rotated it, nice and slow, uh, making sure we wouldn't uh, put any unnecessary input into it uh, and just being real careful. After we uh, finished with the rotation and got the mast of the new solar array pointed toward the telescope, it was time to uh, insert it into the telescope. There you can see the clamp and the mass of the, of the, uh, mass of the solar array going into the clamp on the telescope, on the telescope, uh, clamping it down. And there are a lot of watchful eyes on us while we were doing this. The uh, new solar arrays, unlike the old ones, uh, folded like a book. The old ones just sort of kind of reeled in. The uh, new ones unfolded like a book, and that's the last few degrees of the, uh, of the deploy of the new solar array. And here's what Hubble looks like now with its new solar arrays. Digger was inside uh, busily uh, taping everything. He was kind of like our producer director, Steven Spielberg in space, <laughs> making sure everything got recorded and downlinked. Uh, after we uh, finished our solar array uh, on the second day of EVAs, Jim and I uh, changed out a reaction wheel assembly. This is the exchange of the old one for the new. Jim's got the old one, putting that away to take home, and here's the new one going into the telescope. We had some extra time on EVA2, and uh, at the end of the EVA, here's Jim carrying a new outer blanket layer that was put onto the telescope, and here's a view from, uh, from a helmet camera at the end of that EVA, and you get an idea of uh, what it looks like to us up there, and another helmet camera view. With the uh, stage set for the power system uh, on EVA3, we went out for what we thought was going to be the start of EVA3 and the power control unit change. Unfortunately, due to glitch in a power supply, the uh, water supply in one of the suits started leaking, and so we had about a two-hour delay while we resized the suits. They were designed to do that on orbit, and it's one of the great features that we were s had onboard spares. So I went out with uh, Jim's backpack, and we set out to turn off the telescope the first time in 12 years. That was a scene of the battery being disconnected. This is the power control unit. Uh, I think all of those connectors on the left side there kind of speak for themselves that it was a day to uh, manage frustration and concentrate on one connector at a time. Rick disconnected all the uh, connections on the left. We swapped the old box for the new. This is a photograph or a movie of going in with the new, out with the old, in with the new. And then the reverse, one by one, just one connector after another, uh, putting all those left side connectors back on. We had a special tool to help us do that. And 36 connectors later, the PCU was complete. Uh, one final picture of the telescope on EVA3, and we were ready to set the stage for the next day. Uh, Mike Massimino and I were going to go outside and put in the advanced camera for surveys. This is what uh, Sean was referring to, Mr. Keefe was referring to about the, uh, the new capability for the Hubble, and we're really looking forward to the first pictures that are going to come out. There was an old faint object camera that was no longer being used. First, uh, we took that out of the telescope and uh, temporarily stowed that on the side while the people in, indoors were keeping track and making sure we were doing the right things. The choreography for this part was such that Mike was going to then help me pull the old one out, and then we were going to bring it up and carefully insert it. It had a fairly small capture envelope, and here you see it coming up. But the Goddard Space Flight Center has done remarkable work in, in making some of these tasks almost EVA friendly. There's the big box going in now, and we were able to get it uh, hooked up, and there's Mike hooking up the connectors, and we found out fairly shortly that uh, it was alive and working. We then uh, put the old faint object camera away and got ready to do the cooling system. Okay, a picture of uh, Jim and Mike installing the cache, which is a large cable electronic connection that will reach across from inside the telescope to connect uh, both sides. And uh, in the back of the payload bay, Jim is down there now, about to take out a module called the ESM, which is one of the upgrade units. The upgrade units sold the electronics uh, and routing for the different scientific instruments we're putting in. Scott's uh, on the arm today, flying them around. Uh, you can see him on the hand controllers as Jim passes the ESM up to Mike, who is on the end of the robot arm, stretched almost all the way out to the back end of the payload bay. Now, Jim, uh, after he hands off, uh, will be free-floating, making his way back up to the front of the telescope while Mike flies up. 
You can see the ESM uh, picture of his helmet camera right there, close up. They've got that installed, and they're beginning to replace the connectors on the ESM. They're hand connectors that go on and, uh, and, and latch on with your hand. Nice picture of Mike here as he free floats and comes across. You can see the helmet lights and the cameras, as well as Jim giving a thumbs up through the aft windows. So the flight crew is taking these pictures. And a really nice picture of Jim when they're complete. He's on his back there waving goodbye to the earth uh, through the helmet cameras. Really pretty picture. Now, we had to be electricians and plumbers uh, on EVA-5. Uh, we were putting a new cooling system, an upgrade unit, uh, to replace one that had failed on one of the scientific instruments, an infrared camera. And uh, you can see there's the robot arm there. Uh, we're getting the NCC, that large black box, similar to the ESM. John closed the uh, coverage of the thermal insulation. And uh, John here is on the end of the arm bringing a large radiator around, which will actually go on the outside of Hubble. So we're changing the way Hubble looks and that we're hanging this huge radiator on the back. And you'll see in a second, we've got a large conduit full of uh, plumbing and uh, electrical cables that will actually route under Hubble and bring it back up inside through the bottom. And uh, that large sock there is what's being pushed up by me. You can see me down there on the bottom. We just installed the conduit. John's pulling it through. And eventually, we'll hook that up up top, peel it open, and take these cables and evaporator lines out and hook them up to that black box you just saw us take out a while ago called the NCC. And uh, right now we're getting, uh, actually the NCC seems to be running well and we're getting it to cool down. It's going to take weeks. You can see us uh, as we uh, finish up and we're closing the doors. And a picture of us uh, with the uh, tool handles uh, ready to go back into the airlock. And a really nice picture saying goodbye, uh, end of the day, and beautiful shot of the earth in the background. After the uh, EVAs were complete, it was time to uh, say goodbye to the telescope. It's Nancy and I at the robotics uh, workstation going in for the uh, grapple of the HST while it was still on the uh, support structure. That's a picture of the end effector on top of the grapple fixture. After we uh, latched onto the Hubble, we uh, lifted it up off of the, uh, the, the uh, support structure and got it ready to uh, be deployed. This next scene, you'll see the arm actually coming off of the telescope, followed by Scooter flying us away. You know, it's amazing to look out and see this massive object in the payload bay as it floats right across our window. I think everyone on the flight deck ducked as it went by. Because <laughs> then we had the uh, photo frenzy as everybody got up there to take photos of this amazing event as we just watched it uh, pirouette in space out in front of us as we uh, said goodbye. Just, uh, w I think uh, the telescope looked like it was in great shape there. Rick is using the handheld laser again to take a mark as we drift away. You can see he got 435 feet uh, out. And we had our final uh, goodbye looks as we uh, sped away from the Hubble and, and left it behind. It's just a tremendous jewel uh, for NASA and the world. Let me tell you, after nine hard days, we were looking forward to a day off like you look forward to a two-week vacation. And uh, we're getting things, uh, we're getting ready for the morning there. There's our personal kit. If it's not tied down or Velcroed, you're probably going to lose it on orbit. Here's a uh, cycle ergometer machine that uh, we traded out twice a day to uh, allow folks enough room to work out. Uh, there's Mike getting his workout. Let me tell you, exercise felt great up there. It, uh, was, it was a real necessity. Lunchtime on the mid-deck. Not much extra space, but uh, it's a good thing we all got along with each other. Mike did a good job that day, so here's his reward. Uh, the Earth really zings by. Uh, here's a look straight down at the coast of South America going into the Andes. Uh, you can see how fast we're moving, even though we're 350 miles up. Uh, Scooter's taking some uh, Earth observation shots with a little bit of spare time on that day off. We got some wonderful views. You can see, you can really see the curvature of the Earth up there, uh, up from 350 miles. And we also got some nice uh, sunrises up there. Happens every hour and a half. We did a burn the next day to get ready for entry. You can see Nancy didn't have her seatbelts on. Uh, she's hanging on for dear life, and then uh, the day after that, it was time to come home. We put on our suits and uh, did our deorbit burn and began to fall back into Earth's atmosphere. Things really started to heat up and uh, started flashing outside. Uh, you're going to see in this next shot that Rick is looking at the vertical tail in his mirror. He asked me to look back there and see how it was glowing white hot, and I said, uh, no thanks, buddy. 
<laughs> Some things you just don't want to see. Finally, as we're uh, coming into the Cape, we got our first good look uh, at the ground. It was just a beautiful night uh, as we're falling. This is an infrared shot. You can see uh, the shuttle, the belly of the shuttle heated up from the entry. It's going white hot. As we rolled around uh, and lined up with the runway, called down to the ground, field in sight on a beautiful night. 300 feet, uh, Digger puts down the landing gear. You can see that they appear dark and cold from being stowed up in the belly. And then this is the shot we had as we came in for landing that night uh, as the runway pulls up in front of us. Just pull the nose up, try and uh, touch down as gracefully as you can with a 225,000 uh, glider brick. <laughs> you can see uh, the landing gear as we touch down here are going to spin up and heat up, become uh, sort of white hot right after touchdown. Drag chute comes out. The landing was so much fun, we wanted to do it again. So. <laughs> it's really amazing to me to think that, uh, you know, an hour earlier, we were going five miles every second. Now, uh, here we are back at our home uh, at Kennedy, where we started, uh, stopped at the end of the runway where the convoy comes out to greet us. Everybody, uh, we stop on centerline there. Uh, we all jump out and have a chance to shake hands and say hello. Administrator came to greet us, and we uh, really enjoyed that. Just uh, super to get a chance to look out at the vehicle that took you to space and brought you back. Everybody was uh, really pumped up to be home. And just uh, one chance to say hello and salute all the folks uh, that worked so hard to make this mission a success. <laughs>